Hi, my name is Brother Peter Diamond of MostHolyFamilyMonastery.com. The title of this talk is, The Bible Teaches That Jesus Made St. Peter the First Pope. In order to show that the Bible teaches the Catholic doctrine on the office of the Pope, also known as the Papacy, I will be using the 1611 King James Version of the Bible, a famous Protestant translation. In Matthew chapter 16, we read about one of the most important moments recorded in the Gospels. Jesus gathers his apostles in order to ask them, Whom do men say that I am? And, quote, Whom do you say that I am? One of the twelve, Peter, answers by correctly declaring that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew 16:16 16, 16 to 19, quote, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. End quote. As we see in this verse, Jesus pronounces Peter blessed and says that God the Father had revealed this truth to him. Jesus then gives to Peter the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and declares that whatsoever he binds on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever he looses upon earth shall be loosed in heaven. Even though all twelve disciples are gathered together for this meeting, Jesus says these things only to St. Peter. The change of Peter's name. Jesus also changes his name from Simon to Peter, and says, quote, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. End quote. The Greek word for this, as in this rock, is the demonstrative pronoun tate. It means, quote, this very rock, or this same rock. In the King James Version, that demonstrative pronoun tate is translated as, quote, the same in 1 Corinthians 7.20, and quote this same in Second Corinthians nine four. So Jesus' statement to Peter has this meaning Thou art Peter, and upon this very rock I will build my church. It just so happens that Jesus also changes his name from Simon to a name which means rock, but I will cover more on this later. All of what Jesus says to Saint Peter is obviously very significant, for as Jesus himself says, it concerns the keys to the kingdom of heaven and the very foundation of his church. But let's first look at the change of his name from Simon to Peter. In the Old Testament, a change of name denotes an appointment or a special calling or a change in status. In Genesis 17.5, we read the following about Abraham, quote, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, end quote. God changed his name from Abram to Abraham because the new name denotes his special role as a leader of God's people. Abraham was chosen to be the father of many nations. In Hebrew, Abram signifies a high father, but Abraham signifies the father of the multitude. Likewise, in Genesis 32:28, we read that God also changed Jacob's name to Israel in order to signify his special role or position. So, besides all of the other important things that Jesus says to St. Peter in Matthew 16, the change of his name from Simon to Peter serves to further confirm St. Peter's special position and his new status. The Keys of the Kingdom Now let's look at the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which Jesus says that he will give to St. Peter. No other apostle is given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew 18:18, 18, 18, we read that all the apostles are given the power to bind and to loose, but Peter alone is given the keys of the kingdom of heaven in Matthew 16. This shows us that the power which is given to all of the apostles to bind and to loose in Matthew 18:18 18, 18, must be exercised under the keys which are given alone to St. Peter. This shows us that Peter has a unique position of authority in the church. But here's what's really interesting. Most people don't know that this reference to the keys of the kingdom in Matthew 16 and to Peter's binding and loosing with them comes from Isaiah chapter 22. I hope listeners pay special attention to this point. Jesus' words to Peter in Matthew 16 are a reference to the function of the prime minister of the kingdom in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God established a covenant with David in order to establish a kingdom. The Davidic monarchy, the kingdom of God on earth in the Old Testament, was meant to be a prototype of the kingdom of God which Jesus Christ would establish. 
That's why Jesus is called the Son of David in the Gospels. It's also why Matthew's Gospel has kingdom as one of its primary themes. It's also why Peter himself says in Acts 2.30 that Jesus sits upon David's throne. It's also why Luke 1.32 says the following of Jesus, quote, He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of David his father, End quote. Jesus sits upon the throne of David. But Jesus' kingdom is a spiritual one. His kingdom is his church. Jesus' kingdom not only fulfills but surpasses the prototype, David's kingdom. The point here is that Jesus' kingdom is set up along similar lines as the kingdom of David. In David's kingdom you see not only that there was a king ruling all the subjects, but that the king had royal ministers, a sort of royal cabinet. You see references to this royal cabinet, these chief officers or royal ministers of the king. In Second Kings 8, which is Second Samuel 8 in the Protestant Bible, you also see a reference to them in 3 Kings 4, which is 1 Kings 4 in the Protestant Bible. You see references to this royal cabinet of the king in other passages as well. In this royal cabinet there was a minister of defense, ministers in commerce, provisions, etc., but between the king and his cabinet stood one man, a prime minister, who was over the king's house. And that's where the fascinating truth of Isaiah chapter 22 comes into play. In Isaiah chapter 22 we read that the prime minister had the key to the house of David. Let me repeat that. The prime minister of the kingdom of David had the key to the house of David. This represented the prime minister's authority over the house of the king. In Isaiah 22, the prime minister of the kingdom was a man named Shebna. Isaiah 22.15 says that Shebna was, quote, over the house, that is, over the house of the king. Then Shebna left the office of prime minister and was replaced by a man named Eliakim. And the key of the house of David, the key of the kingdom, which Shebna had, was given by King Hezekiah, who was the successor of David reigning as the king at that time, to Eliakim. King Hezekiah gave the key to the kingdom to Eliakim because Eliakim succeeded Shebna in the office of prime minister. Isaiah 22.20, And it shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy Shebna's robe, and strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open." End quote. Eliakim now had the key to the house of David, so that everyone would see this man, Eliakim, holding the key of the kingdom, the key of the house of David, and would say that this man is the king's prime minister. Think about the striking similarity to Matthew chapter 16. In Isaiah 22 we not only see the clear reference to the key of the kingdom being passed, just as Jesus gave the keys to St. Peter, but the statement that with the key, quote, he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open, end quote, is strikingly similar to what Jesus says to St. Peter in Matthew 16:19, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose upon earth shall be loosed also in heaven, end quote. So the significance of this should be very obvious to everyone listening to these points. Jesus sits upon the throne of David. So when Jesus comes to establish his kingdom, his church, which is the fulfillment of the kingdom of David, he likewise appoints his royal cabinet, his apostles. But of those royal ministers, his apostles, there is one prime minister, the one who is over all the other ministers and all the subjects of his kingdom. The prime minister is the one who will have the keys of his kingdom and will be given the primacy in his church to look after the affairs of his kingdom. Thus, when Jesus said to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, it would have been a clear signal to all educated Jews that Jesus was going to make St. Peter his prime minister. Jesus was declaring that St. Peter would be the first pope, the president or governor of his church. This is a powerful and irrefutable proof that Jesus was indeed saying that St. Peter would be the first pope in Matthew 16. And just like the office of prime minister in the Old Testament was an office with succession, Eliakim took the place of Shebna, so too is the office of the Pope. We know this from the early church fathers, that St. Peter established his seat of authority in Rome. St. Peter was succeeded as the Bishop of Rome and head of the church by Pope Linus, then Pope Cletus, then Pope Clement, and so on. 
The early Christian church, as will be covered in another section, recognized in the Bishop of Rome the successor to St. Peter's authority, the visible head of the Christian church. Now there are two other points worthy of mention about Isaiah 22. In Isaiah 22:23, the very verse after the reference to the key of the kingdom and the opening and shutting with it, we read, quote, And I will fasten him, Eliakim, as a nail in a sure place. End quote. This is interesting because it speaks of the prime minister being fastened or secured in his office. His office has a firm and immovable quality and strength to it. Doesn't that sound like Jesus' reference to the rock in Matthew 16, something which is firm and not easily crushed or broken? The other point worthy of mention is that in Isaiah 22:21 it says that the prime minister Eliakim shall be, quote, a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, end quote. That's interesting because the term pope actually means father. A true pope is a father over the universal church because Christ has given him authority over all the subjects of the Christian church, as we will see also in John's Gospel. And no, it's not forbidden to use the term father, for St. Paul describes himself as a spiritual father to Timothy in 1 Corinthians 4.15, and in Acts 7.2, Stephen says, quote, Brethren and fathers, hear me, end quote. There are many other examples that could be given. Who is the rock of Matthew 16? It's Peter. So now that we've covered the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and shown that Jesus was clearly indicating that St. Peter was to be the prime minister of his kingdom, we must move back to the issue of who is the rock of Matthew 16. Protestants raise all kinds of objections on this point, trying to insert a divide between Peter and the rock. They first say that Jesus couldn't have been saying that Peter was the rock, because 1 Corinthians 3.11 says that Jesus is the only foundation that can be laid. What they fail to realize is that Scripture speaks of all the apostles as foundations. Revelation 21.14, quote, And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb, end quote. Is there a contradiction between Revelation 21.14 and 1 Corinthians 3? No, of course not. The fact that Christ is the only foundation, as 1 Corinthians 3 teaches, simply means that everything comes from Christ. All true authority in the church must come from Christ, for the church itself comes from Christ. Anything outside of Christ is a false foundation. Well, Peter's authority comes precisely from Jesus Christ, as Matthew 16 shows. It's quite obvious, therefore, that if Jesus is the one who established these things in Peter, then what's set up in Peter is not a foundation other than of Christ. It's the very foundation of Christ. So we see clearly from these points and from Revelation 21:14 that the fact that Christ is the foundation or the cornerstone, as we read in Ephesians 2.20, does not mean that Christ himself could not or did not establish one apostle to have a perpetual office which would be the rock upon which the church will be built. The two concepts are not mutually exclusive. For example, Jesus is the good shepherd, John 10.14, but he also gives the responsibility of shepherding all his sheep to Peter, as we will see in John 21.15-17. Jesus is the one with the keys, Revelation 1.18, Revelation 3.7, but he gives his keys to Peter. God is declared as the rock throughout the Old Testament and in Deuteronomy 32.4, but Abraham is also described as the rock in Isaiah 51.1-2. Isaiah 51.1-2, quote, Look unto the rock whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit whence ye are digged. Look unto Abraham your father, end quote. Notice that the Old Testament says, look to the rock, look to Abraham. Abraham is described as the rock because he was the father of all the Israelites. Abraham's name was changed from Abram to signify his role as rock and father of God's people. Wouldn't it be fitting, then, for Jesus to choose someone as the rock and father in the New Testament of the new Israel, the church? Yes, and that's why Simon's name was changed to Petros, which means rock. Now that we've answered the objection that Peter couldn't have been the rock because Jesus is the foundation slash cornerstone, let's move to some other objections in this regard. Protestants say that Jesus couldn't have been saying that Peter was the rock because in the Greek of Matthew 16, Peter's name is Petros, which means small stone, while the word to denote the rock is Petra, which means large rock. The Greek says, Thou art Petros, and upon this very Petra, I will build my church. But there are many problems with this argument. 
First, scholars of various religions acknowledge that Petros, P-E-T-R-O-S, and Petra, P-E-T-R-A, were synonyms in the Greek used in the first century. It's true that hundreds of years before the time of Christ, Petros meant small stone and Petra, large rock, in some ancient Greek poetry. But at the time of the writing of the Gospel of Matthew, that distinction had disappeared. Petros and Petra had a difference in meaning in Attic Greek, but in Koine Greek, both Petros and Petra meant rock. The New Testament was written in Koine Greek. But why then is there any difference between the two words? The answer is found in the very important fact that Jesus spoke in Aramaic, not in Greek. In Aramaic, the passage would say this, quote, You are Kepha, and upon this Kepha I will build my church. Kepha, spelled K-E-P-H-A. Notice that in Aramaic, the same word Kepha is used in both places. There is absolutely no difference between the two. Jesus was equating Simon and the rock upon which the church would be built. He wasn't contrasting them. This fact is also captured in French translations of this passage, which say, Tu es Pierre et sur set Pierre. You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. However, the Protestant misunderstanding comes in because when one translates the Aramaic which Jesus spoke into the Greek, the Aramaic word kepha, K-E-P-H-A, becomes Petra, P-E-T-R-A. Petra is the normal word for rock in Greek, and it's feminine. The fact that Petra is feminine is no problem for the second part of the passage, upon this kepha, upon this rock. But Petra obviously cannot be used for Peter's new name because Peter is a man. So, in the Greek, Peter's name is changed to Petros, P-E-T-R-O-S, a synonym for Petra, but one which has a masculine ending. That's the only reason that there is any difference at all between the two words. There is no doubt that Jesus was declaring that Peter is the rock. Even some Protestants have been forced to admit, in the face of the facts, that it's futile to continue to deny that Peter is the rock. David Hill, Presbyterian minister and senior lecturer at the University of Sheffield, writes, quote, It is on Peter himself, the confessor of his messiahship, that Jesus will build the church. Attempts to interpret the rock as something other than Peter in person, for example his faith, the truth revealed to him, are due to Protestant bias, and introduce to the statement a degree of subtlety which is highly unlikely, end quote. In the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, a Protestant work edited by Protestants Gerhard Kittel and Gerhard Friedrich, there is an article by famed Protestant Oscar Kohlmann. This is found in Volume 6, Number 108 of the Theological Dictionary. In that article, the Protestant Kohlmann states, quote, But what does Jesus mean when he says, On this rock I will build my church? The idea of the Reformers that he is referring to the faith of Peter is quite inconceivable in view of the probably different setting of the story. For there is no reference here to the faith of Peter. Rather, the parallelism of Thou art rock, and on this rock I will build my church, shows that the second rock can only be the same as the first. It is thus evident that Jesus is referring to Peter, to whom he has given the name rock. He appoints Peter to be the foundation of his ecclesia. To this extent, Roman Catholic exegesis is right, and all attempts to evade this interpretation are to be rejected." End quote. Dr. John Brodus, a Reformed Baptist Bible scholar from the 19th century, was forced to admit, quote, As Peter means rock, the natural interpretation is that upon this rock means upon thee. No other explanation would probably at the present day be attempted. But there is a play upon words, understand as you may. It is an even more far-fetched and harsh play upon words if we understand the rock to be Christ, and a very feeble and almost unmeaning play upon words if the rock is Peter's confession. Let it be observed that Jesus could not here mean himself by the rock, consistently with the image, because he is the builder. To say, I will build, would be a very confused image. The suggestion of some expositors that in saying, Thou art Peter, and on this rock, Jesus pointed at himself, involves an artificiality which to some minds is repulsive. End quote. Commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, 1886, page 356. The Baptist D. A. Carson, professor of New Testament at Trinity Evangelical Seminary, was also forced to acknowledge, quote, Although it is true that Petros and Petra can mean stone and rock respectively in earlier Greek, the distinction is largely confined to poetry. 
Moreover, the underlying Aramaic is in this case unquestionable, and most probably kepha, K-A-P-H-A, was used in both clauses, you are kepha and on this kepha, since the word was used both for a name and for a rock. The Greek makes the distinction between Petros and Petra simply because it is trying to preserve the pun, and in Greek the feminine Petra could not very well serve as a masculine name. End quote. From the Expositor's Bible Commentary, Volume 8, page 368. So even these Protestants cannot deny that Jesus was declaring Peter to be the rock. Now, since the Aramaic which Jesus spoke is so interesting in further proving this point, consider the evidence that Jesus did in fact speak in Aramaic. We know that Jesus spoke Aramaic, first of all, because some of his words are preserved for us in the Gospels. Look at Matthew 27:46, where Jesus says from the cross, quote, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, end quote. That's Aramaic, it's not Greek. It means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Look also at John 19:13 and 17, quote, When Pilate sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha, and Jesus bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, end quote. Both Gabbatha and Golgotha are Aramaic words, more evidence that this was the language Jesus used. But St. John calls them Hebrew in the Bible because, as scholars explain, that Hebrew, as commonly used in the New Testament, refers to the Aramaic. There is also strong evidence from the early church fathers that the Gospel of Matthew was originally written in Aramaic and then translated into Greek. Eusebius, who is the historian of the early church, the first one to write a history of the church from the beginning to his own day in the 4th century, repeatedly stated that Matthew wrote his gospel in Hebrew, meaning Aramaic. In Book 3, Chapter 3 of his Ecclesiastical History, Eusebius quotes Papias to state, quote, Matthew composed his history in the Hebrew dialect, and everyone translated it as he was able, end quote. By the Hebrew dialect, he means Aramaic. In Book 6, Chapter 25, Eusebius quotes Origen to state, quote, The first gospel is written according to Matthew, who, having published it for Jewish converts, wrote it in the Hebrew, end quote. In Book 6, Chapter 25, Eusebius quotes the great early church father, St. Irenaeus, to state, quote, Matthew indeed produced his gospel written among the Hebrews in their own dialect, while Peter and Paul proclaimed the gospel and founded the church at Rome. End quote. In this citation, Eusebius quotes St. Irenaeus, who not only says that Matthew wrote his gospel in the Hebrew dialect, meaning Aramaic, but also that Peter founded the church at Rome, something many non Catholics deny, even though the historical evidence that Peter was in Rome is irrefutable. Keep in mind that Eusebius, who cites Papias, Origen, and Irenaeus to show that Matthew wrote in Aramaic, lived from approximately 260 to 340 A.D. and wrote the very first complete church history. And as if that were not sufficient to silence all objections in this regard, we actually have internal biblical evidence that Peter's name in Greek, Petros, is equivalent to Petra, the rock upon which the church is built. This internal evidence comes from John 142. John 142 equates Peter's name with the rock. Please follow this logically. John 142, New International Version, quote, Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, C-E-P-H-A-S, which, when translated, is Peter, end quote. Notice that in John 142, Peter's new name is given in its Aramaic form, Cephas. Some may ask, I thought Peter's name was Kepha, K-A-P-H-A, in Aramaic. Yes, but in English versions of John 142, such as the one I'm reading from, Kepha is simply anglicized as Cephas. So John 142, which is referring to Peter's name in its original Aramaic, says that Cephas is translated as Peter. To put it as simply as possible, John 142 gives us the key that St. Peter's new name is equivalent to the Aramaic word Kepha. And we know that the Aramaic word kepha would be translated into Greek as Petra. Therefore, we know that Peter's name, which is translated into Greek as Petros, is equivalent to Petra. Peter's new name is equivalent to the rock. There's no doubt about it.
Even the famous Eastern Orthodox scholar John Meyendorf had to admit that the Bible teaches that Peter is the rock. Quote, Peter is the Corpheus of the Apostolic Choir. He is the first disciple of Christ and speaks always on behalf of all. It is true that other apostles, John, James, and Paul, are also called Corphae and primates, but Peter alone is the rock of the church. His primacy has, therefore, not only a personal character, but bears an ecclesiological significance. End quote. From the primacy of Peter, Ellsbury Bucks, UK, The Faith Press, 1973, page 14. Also, think for a moment about how absurd it would be if Jesus were not saying that Peter is the rock. As we've just shown, Jesus pronounces Peter alone blessed. Jesus changes St. Peter's name alone to rock. Jesus gathers his disciples and gives the keys of the kingdom alone to Peter. But when he's talking about the rock, even though the statement comes in the midst of all these, Protestants would have us believe that Jesus is not talking about Peter, but about himself or something else. It's ridiculous. It's so obviously false that argumentation really shouldn't be necessary. Further, it should be noted that the reason that Jesus says, while referring to Peter, Upon this rock I will build my church, rather than upon you I will build my church, is because while Peter is clearly the rock, the foundation he is setting up in Peter is an office which will persist through the ages well after Peter is gone. It's founded upon Peter, but will continue to exist after Peter is gone. Moreover, the early church fathers, the prominent early Christian writers of the first centuries, recognized that Peter is the rock. There are many citations one could bring forward, but here are just a few. Tertullian on Monogamy 213 AD refers to Peter and speaks of the church, quote, built upon him. St. Cyril of Alexandria, 370-444, to who played a key role with the Council of Ephesus, stated in his commentary on John, quote, He, Jesus, suffers him to be no longer called Simon. He changed his name into Peter from the word Petra, rock, for on him he was afterwards to found his church, end quote. St. Basil the Great, 330-379, to wrote in Against Eunomians 4, quote, Peter, who on account of the preeminence of his faith, received upon himself the building of the church. St. Gregory Nazianzen, Great Eastern Father, 329-389, Oration 26, quote, Of all the disciples of Christ, all of whom were to be great and deserving of the choice, one is called rock and entrusted with the foundations of the church. St. John Chrysostom, the Great Eastern Father and Bishop of Constantinople, 387 A.D., Homily 3, De Penitentiae 4, quote, Peter himself the head or crown of the apostles. When I name Peter, I name that unbroken rock, that firm foundation, end quote. One could also quote St. Ambrose, Jerome, and many others, but the point should be clear. It should also be noted that some non-Catholics, in an effort to argue against the papacy, say that Jesus was referring to Peter's faith, not Peter himself, as the rock upon which the church would be built. They will even cite some selective passages from the early church fathers in an attempt to prove this. For instance, they will cite this passage from St. Hilary of Poitiers, who is considered the St. Athanasius of the West. St. Hilary on the Trinity 6 and 37, quote, This faith is the foundation of the church. Through this faith the gates of hell cannot prevail against her, end quote. But what they fail to tell you is that in the very same work, St. Hilary said that Simon Peter was the foundation of the church. On the Trinity 6.20, quote, Blessed Simon, who after his confession of the mystery, was set up to be the foundation stone of the church, and received the keys of the kingdom of heaven. St. Hilary of Poitier also stated in his commentary on Matthew 7.6, Peter believeth first, and is the prince of the apostleship, end quote. So we can see that the fathers understood that Peter's faith is inseparable from Peter himself and from the office which Jesus set up in Peter as prime minister of his church. We see this once again in Luke chapter 22. Peter's unfailing faith. In Luke chapter 22 we find another very important but often overlooked passage in the Bible which proves the Catholic teaching on the papacy. Luke 22:24-32, quote, And there was also a strife among them which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that doth serve. 
and I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren." End quote. This passage is fascinating and has a number of very important things. First of all, there is a strife among the apostles about who will be the greatest. But Jesus explains that his kingdom is not like that of the Gentiles. So he's talking about how his kingdom or his church is structured. He then says that Satan has desired to sift all the apostles in the plural, but that he has prayed for Peter, singular, that Peter's faith fail not. Jesus directly declares that Peter, the one who we know receives the keys of the kingdom of heaven, also has an unfailing faith. Again, Jesus only says this about Peter, clearly separating him from the rest. And it's fascinating that the word infallible means cannot fail. Thus we see, right in Luke chapter 22, the roots of the Catholic teaching on the infallibility of the Pope. This teaching on the infallibility of the Pope does not mean that a true Pope, as the successor of St. Peter, can never make a mistake. It does not mean that he cannot sin. What it means is that when a true Pope teaches authoritatively on faith or morals to the entire Church, when he teaches from the chair of St. Peter, Jesus will not let that teaching fail, because then the Church itself would be led into error and fail. Vatican I put it this way, Pope Pius IX, Vatican Council I, Session 4, 1870, quote, So, this gift of truth and a never-failing faith was divinely conferred upon Peter and his successors in this chair. End quote. It's an unfailing faith of the office of prime minister which has been established in Peter and will carry on through his successors in that office. And this infallibility which we see in Luke 22 corresponds to what we see given to Peter in Matthew 16. Whatever Peter binds on earth is bound in heaven. Certainly heaven cannot bind that which is false. Therefore, whatever Peter or a true pope binds must be true. It must be infallible. And non-Catholics who claim to believe in the Bible believe that God gave infallibility to the men who wrote the books of the Bible. So, in light of all of this evidence from the Bible itself, it shouldn't be hard for any person to accept that God gives infallibility to the prime minister or pope of his church, when the Pope of his church fulfills the requirements to speak infallibly. As one Protestant minister even admitted, if papal primacy is true, papal infallibility logically follows. For there would be no point for God to found his church upon Peter and give him supreme authority over the flock, if, when making doctrinal judgments which bind the universal church, he could lead the entire flock into error. 1 Timothy 3.15 says that the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. And even in the very early church, the fathers saw this passage in Luke 22 as another example of papal primacy. St. Ambrose, 4th century, in Psalm 43, number 40, quote, Peter, after having been tempted by the devil, is set over the church. The Lord chose him as the pastor of the Lord's flock. For to him he said, But thou, when converted, confirm thy brethren. Luke 22. End quote. Jesus entrusts all of his sheep to Peter in John chapter 21. John 21, 15 to 17, quote, So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved, because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things, thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. End quote. As we see here in John 21, Jesus entrusts all of his sheep to St. Peter. The dogmatic First Vatican Council of the Catholic Church said that this moment in John 21, after the resurrection of Jesus, was the time that Jesus actually gave St. Peter the keys and the authority over his church, which he had promised him in Matthew chapter 16. It's important to emphasize that this moment after the resurrection, in John 21, was the point at which Jesus made St. Peter the first pope. 
This is significant because some non-Catholics bring up St. Peter's threefold denial of Christ in John 18. When Peter denied Jesus Christ, it was before the crucifixion. Peter was not yet the Pope. Jesus had not yet given St. Peter the authority as Pope. The words in Matthew 16, before the crucifixion, promise the keys of the kingdom to St. Peter. They promise that Jesus would build his church upon him and make him the prime minister of his church. But that office was not conferred upon Peter until after the resurrection by these words in John 21. So St. Peter's denial of Christ poses no problem at all for Catholic teaching on the papacy. Further, the Catholic Church does not teach that a true pope cannot sin mortally or even lose his soul. It teaches that a true pope holds the position of supreme authority in the church, and that when a true pope teaches in a binding fashion to the universal church, God will protect him from teaching error. The power is in the office itself, which is protected by Christ. But moving back to the passage, Jesus tells Peter to feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. Jesus clearly gives St. Peter authority over his flock, the members of his church. Some may ask why Jesus says the first time, feed my lambs, and the second and third times, feed my sheep. The early church fathers understood this reference to lambs and sheep to differentiate between younger and older members of the church, or to distinguish between the faithful and the clergy. All of them are entrusted to St. Peter. Now what's particularly important is that when Jesus says, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, the second command of the three is the word poimene in Greek. In the first and third commands that Jesus gives to Peter about his flock, the word in Greek is baske. Baske means to feed, but the word poimene, the second command of Jesus to Peter about the flock, means to rule. It is also translated as tend. So Jesus not only commissioned Peter to feed his church, but to rule it. It's fascinating that the word poimene, which Jesus uses about Peter's authority over the flock in John 21.16, is also used in Revelation 2.27. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. End quote. So this means that Peter not only has a primacy over Christ's flock, but a primacy of jurisdiction to rule and govern the flock, contrary to what the Eastern Orthodox would say. The same word, poimene, is used in Revelation 12.5 and elsewhere to indicate the power to rule. Here is what the great Eastern Father of the Church, St. John Chrysostom, said about this passage in John 21 in the 4th century. From homilies on John 88.1, Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. And why, having passed by the others, does he speak with Peter on these matters? He was the chosen one of the apostles, the mouth of the disciples, the leader of the band. The denial was done away. Jesus putteth into his hands the chief authority among the brethren, and he bringeth not forward the denial, nor reproacheth him with what had taken place, but saith, If thou lovest me, preside over thy brethren. End quote. Thus, John twenty one fifteen to seventeen constitutes another powerful and irrefutable proof that Jesus made Saint Peter the first Pope. The prominence of Peter's name in Scripture. Another fact which demonstrates that Jesus made St. Peter the first pope is the prominence of Peter's name in Scripture. Peter is named well over 100 times in the New Testament. The next closest apostle is John, who is named merely 29 times. Further, the way that Scripture uses his name is extremely telling. Here are some examples. People should think about the significance of these examples. Notice that in these passages, Peter is mentioned by name, while the other disciples are repeatedly mentioned as those with Peter. They show that Scripture singles out St. Peter and sets him apart from the other disciples. Mark 16.7 But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. End quote. Acts 2.37 Now when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? End quote. Acts 5.29, quote, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, quote, Mark 1.36, quote, And Simon Peter and they that were with him followed after him. End quote. Luke 8.45, quote, And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee. End quote. 
Luke 9.32, quote, But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep, end quote. Peter is clearly singled out as the leader of the apostles, and it's significant that the New Testament writer singled out Peter in this way, even though they wrote years after the resurrection. This shows us that Peter's position of leadership still held its significance as the church continued. Further, every list of the twelve apostles in the New Testament has Peter's name first and Judas's name last. This is true even though the order of the other apostles in between is not always exactly the same. You can see those lists in Matthew 10.2, Luke 6.13, and Acts 1.13. In Matthew's list, St. Matthew not only lists Peter first, but calls him first. Quote, first, Simon. Matthew 10.2 now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter. The Greek word he uses in Matthew 10.2, protos, means first or chief. It means chief in Matthew 20.27 20, and other passages. Since no other numbers are given in the list, and Peter was not the first one who followed Jesus, Andrew was, this statement is clearly not meant to assign a number to St. Peter but to indicate that he is the chief or leader of the twelve. Another point which is not necessarily as important, but it is interesting, is the fact that in John 20 we read that both Peter and John ran to the sepulchre from which Jesus rose again. John outran Peter and got there first, but John didn't go in. John stopped and waited for Peter to go in. John 20, 4-6, quote, so they both ran together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulchre. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying, yet he went not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen cloths lie. The fact that Jesus made St. Peter the first pope shows itself again and again after the resurrection, in the Acts of the early church, in the Acts of the Apostles. Peter takes the prime role in the replacement of Judas. The replacement of Judas shows apostolic succession. In Acts 1 we read about the decision to replace the deceased Judas with another apostle. Peter stands up in the midst of the rest and directs the course of action to replace Judas. Acts 1, 15-20, quote, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spoke before concerning Judas. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his bishopric let another take. End quote. This passage in Acts 1 not only demonstrates Peter's position of authority as the first pope, but also shows us apostolic succession. That is to say, the positions of the apostles, the bishops, continue on with replacements after these apostles or first bishops died. Speaking of Judas's place, Acts 1.20 says, Let his bishopric another take. The bishops were to be replaced down through history as the church continued its mission, so that when St. Peter himself dies in Rome as its first bishop, his place as prime minister and leader of the Christian church will also be filled by another bishop of Rome, the second pope. In Acts 2, we see St. Peter's primacy as the pope in his long speech to the Jews. Acts 2.14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Be this known unto you. End quote. Notice again the language, quote, Peter standing up with the eleven. This was on the day of Pentecost, considered the birthday of the church where all the leaders of the church were gathered. After Peter preached to the Jews, they asked the men, plural, what they should do, and it was again Peter who answered for everyone. Acts 2, 37-38, quote, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. End quote. This passage also shows us that there is no salvation outside the church which is led by St. Peter, the Catholic Church.
In Acts 4, Peter's primacy as Pope is shown in his speech to the leadership of the Jews. At a gathering with the high priest, the question was posed to them, By what power have you done this? And St. Peter again answered for the rest. Acts 4, 6-10 and 12, quote, And Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, End quote. In Acts 5, the apostles are again questioned by the high priest and charged not to teach in Jesus' name. Acts 5.29, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. End quote. If all of the apostles answered as this verse says, then why would the scripture word it in this way, mentioning Peter by himself? It's obviously because Peter was the leader of the apostles, being the first pope. In the same chapter, Acts 5, we see that Peter meets out the discipline of the church in the case of Ananias and Sapphira. The first Gentile convert is told specifically to go to St. Peter, the head of the church. In Acts 10, we read about the first Gentile convert, Cornelius. People must keep in mind the significance of the receiving of Cornelius into the church. Receiving the first Gentile convert was a monumental event which showed the universality of the one true church. Therefore, the fact that the angel tells Cornelius to go specifically to St. Peter, and that Peter will tell him what he must do, provides us with another illustration of the primacy of St. Peter as head of the church. Acts 10, 4-6, quote, And when he looked on him, he, Cornelius, was afraid, and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa, and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. End quote. The vision that the old law's restrictions against unclean foods is over, which signified the end of the old law, is given to St. Peter, the head of the church. In accordance with the angel's instructions to the first Gentile convert, Cornelius, to go to St. Peter, it's equally significant that St. Peter alone is given the vision about the end of the old law and its prescriptions. Acts 10, 9-13, quote, On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour, and he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they were made ready, he fell into a trance, and saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending upon him, as if it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. End quote. It's very interesting that the vision is given to St. Peter three times. This corresponds with John 21:15 to 17 where three times Jesus indicates to Peter that all the members of his church are entrusted to him. This corresponds to the threefold office of St. Peter and of all true popes, to teach and guard the true doctrine, to watch over the church's liturgy or worship, and to govern the church by discipline. St. Peter clearly has the primacy at the Council of Jerusalem. In Acts 15, we read about the dissension concerning circumcision. Some were teaching that all Gentile converts to the gospel had to undergo circumcision to be saved. After much disputing, Paul and Barnabas went to the apostles at Jerusalem to consult about this question. There was a council with all the leaders of the church. It is sometimes called the First Ecumenical Council of the Christian Church. Acts 15.7, And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made a choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. End quote. So after much disputing, St. Peter rises up and delivers the first address to silence the argument and give the decision. That's because he was the leader of the church, the first pope.
And the Bible makes a special mention of the fact that when Peter spoke and gave his decision, the multitude kept silence. Acts 15.12, quote, Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them, end quote. And after that, St. James spoke, for, as early church historian Eusebius tells us, he was left to be the bishop over the local church at Jerusalem. The promulgation of the decision reached at the Council of Jerusalem shows the power of the church and of ecumenical councils. Acts 15, 28-29, quote, For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, end quote. Notice that they reached a decision at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, after Jesus had left the earth, by their own authority which they had received from Christ. And this continued through the ages in the true church, the Catholic Church. Since the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth, as we read in 1 Timothy 3.15, the commands and precepts and decisions it issues are binding, if confirmed, by the authority of the supreme bishop, the Pope, for he has the power to bind and loose from Christ. That's why we read that after the Council of Jerusalem, Paul preached that people must follow these precepts. Acts 15.41, quote, And he, Paul, went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches, commanding them to keep the precepts of the apostles and the ancients, end quote. It's interesting that this verse is not complete in the Protestant Bible. The King James removed keeping the precepts of the apostles and ancients because it shows the authority of the church and an authority which must be heeded outside the Bible. Jesus founded the office of St. Peter so that it would continue down through history. We've seen without any doubt that Jesus made St. Peter the first pope. Certainly it would have been pointless for Jesus to institute all of these things in St. Peter if as soon as Peter died just a few decades later, the office he instituted in Peter ceased to exist. Such a notion is absurd and refutes itself. It is blatantly obvious, therefore, that the office which Jesus instituted in St. Peter was to continue with successors, just like the office of Prime Minister in the Old Testament had successors, and just like the Apostles led by St. Peter found a replacement for Judas in Acts 1.20. The successors to the positions of the Apostles are bishops. Priests were also ordained by the bishops in order to distribute the sacraments of the Church. It's important to note that in the Old Testament spiritual authority was passed down through the laying on of hands. Likewise, in the New Testament, the power of bishops and priests is passed on or transmitted through the laying on of hands in ordination. In Deuteronomy 34.9, we see that spiritual authority was passed down through the laying on of hands in the case of Moses to Joshua. Deuteronomy 34.9, And Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom, for Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him. End quote. In the New Testament, we see that Paul, who was not one of the original twelve, establishes Timothy as the bishop of Ephesus and Titus as the bishop of Crete in order to lead the church in those places. The laying on of hands was again involved in this passing on of authority. Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands, end quote. Titus 1.5, For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. End quote. Galatians 1.18 also tells us that a few years after his conversion, Paul spent fifteen days with St. Peter in Jerusalem, where he was obviously more fully instructed in his ministry by the leader of the Christian church. It should also be noted that contrary to what some think, the incident in Galatians 2.11, where St. Paul rebukes Cephas for giving a false impression to Gentile converts, does not necessarily refer to St. Peter. In Book 1, Chapter 12 of his Ecclesiastical History, Eusebius, the historian of the primitive church, quotes early church writer Clement of Alexandria, to attribute the incident in Galatians 2.11 to another Cephas, 
who was not one of the original twelve, but was one of the seventy disciples of our Lord who had the same name as St. Peter. And even if St. Paul had rebuked St. Peter himself in Galatians 2.11, it still wouldn't disprove Catholic teaching on the papacy. For the Catholic Church does not teach that a true pope cannot make mistakes or give a bad example. Rather, it teaches that a true pope is protected by Jesus Christ from teaching error, when teaching on a point of faith or morals in a binding way to the universal church. So there is no proof that this was St. Peter at all whom St. Paul rebuked in Galatians 2.11. But moving back to the point about Paul's establishment of Timothy and Titus in Ephesus and Crete respectively, this proves that the hierarchy of the church continued to have successors after the original twelve apostles and in the years after the ascension of Jesus. Thus, if there were successors to the positions of other bishops and other local churches, as the church continued and expanded its mission, certainly there were successors to the most important office of all in the church hierarchy, the office which was held by St. Peter. The Proof That St. Peter Was the First Bishop of Rome Some non-Catholics don't accept the Catholic position on the papacy because they don't believe that St. Peter was ever in Rome. They argue that the Bible doesn't explicitly mention that St. Peter went to Rome. It's true that the Bible doesn't explicitly state that St. Peter was in Rome, but there are countless things about the truth of the Christian religion which the Bible doesn't explicitly state. The Bible doesn't tell us how St. Paul died, but it's certain that he did. St. John also says in John 21:25 that there are countless things which Jesus did which were not written in the Bible. Thus, the fact that the Bible doesn't explicitly say something doesn't prove that it didn't happen. But we do find an allusion to Peter being in Rome in 1 Peter 5.13. In 1 Peter 5.13, St. Peter says that he is writing from Babylon. 1 Peter 5.13, quote, The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus my son, end quote. Babylon was a code name for Rome because of Rome's notorious immoralities. Most scholars agree that Peter was certainly not in Babylon, but in Rome when writing these words in 1 Peter 5.13. Both St. Jerome and Eusebius, who was the historian of the primitive church, agree that St. Peter wrote these words in Rome. Moreover, in his epistle to the Romans, St. Paul says that he did not come to Rome at that time he was writing the epistle, because he didn't want to build upon another man's foundation. Romans 15:20 and 23, quote, And I have so preached this gospel not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation, for which cause also I was hindered very much from coming to you, end quote. Not wanting to build on another man's foundation is an indication that the church at Rome had been founded by an apostle, for it was the apostles who laid the foundations. This is, therefore, probably a subtle reference by St. Paul to St. Peter's having founded the church at Rome. For who do the writers of the early church say founded the church at Rome? As we will see, they say undoubtedly that it was St. Peter. It's also possible that St. Paul doesn't mention St. Peter by name in his epistle to the Romans, because St. Peter might have been temporarily expelled from Rome under Claudius in 49 AD. Acts 18.2 says that under Claudius all the Jews were commanded to leave Rome. Now we will look at the indisputable historical facts which prove that St. Peter went to Rome, the capital of the Roman Empire. God wanted his prime apostle to set up his bishopric in Rome, so that the city which was the capital of the world would also become the permanent capital of his church, so that the world which called the empire which ruled it by the name of Rome would call his church, which was to teach it the only way to salvation, by the name Roman. It's also a fact that St. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, went to Rome eventually and died there. Both St. Peter and St. Paul were martyrs in Rome under Nero in approximately 67 A.D., St. Peter was crucified upside down, while St. Paul, being a Roman citizen, was beheaded. The overwhelming historical evidence for this comes from the earliest writers of the Christian Church. These earliest and most prominent writers of the Christian Church are called the Fathers of the Church. The very earliest of these Fathers of the Church are called the Apostolic Fathers because of their close connection to the Apostles. 
Among the Apostolic Fathers, St. Ignatius of Antioch holds a prominent place. St. Ignatius of Antioch lived from approximately the year 50 to the year 117. He was the third bishop of Antioch and was taught by the Apostle St. John. He also died heroically as a martyr. The epistles of St. Ignatius of Antioch are a staple in every collection of the writings of the Apostolic Fathers. St. Ignatius repeatedly speaks of the authority and the role of bishops in the Church. This shows us that from the very earliest ages there was no doubt that the Church of Christ had a hierarchy. Ignatius also says in unequivocal terms that the Eucharist is the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. St. Ignatius of Antioch is also the first recorded writer to use the term, quote, Catholic Church. In his letter to the Smyrnians, 8-2, dated approximately 107 A.D., St. Ignatius writes, quote, Wherever the bishop appears, let the congregation be present. Just as wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church, end quote. In Greek, the word Catholic means universal. The Catholic Church is the universal Christian Church. It's the one universal Church of Jesus Christ which was established upon Peter. Isn't it interesting that the first recorded author to use the term Catholic Church was St. Ignatius of Antioch? Acts 11.26 tells us that the term Christians was also first used at Antioch. Acts 11.26, quote, And they conversed there in the church a whole year, and they taught a great multitude, so that at Antioch the disciples were first named Christians, end quote. Catholics and Christians are one and the same thing because the Catholic Church is the Christian Church. St. Ignatius of Antioch also had something interesting to say about Peter and Paul in Rome. In his Epistle to the Romans, section 4, written approximately 110 A.D., St. Ignatius writes, quote, I do not order you as did Peter and Paul, end quote. We will come back to St. Ignatius, but here are some other citations from the Fathers of the Church which show that St. Peter, the head of the Christian Church, died in Rome as its first bishop. Tertullian, Demur Against the Heretics, 36 one, written 200 A.D., says, quote, If you come across into Asia, you have Ephesus, but if you are near to Italy, you have Rome, whence also our authority derives. How happy is that church on which the apostles poured out their whole doctrine along with their blood, where Peter endured a passion like that of the Lord, end quote. Notice that Tertullian, a very prominent writer of the early church, in 200 A.D., not only indicated that Peter was in Rome, but that the ecclesiastical authority of his church derives from the Church of Rome. In other words, the church where St. Peter was, the church at Rome, had superior authority. Eusebius, the historian of the primitive church, who lived in the 3rd and 4th centuries, attests in many places to the fact that Peter was in Rome. As just one example, in Book 5, Chapter 28, Number 3 of his Ecclesiastical History, Eusebius quotes an author who states, quote, Victor, who was the thirteenth bishop of Rome from Peter. End quote. Eusebius's history of the early church gives the successions of bishops of all the prominent local churches, including Rome. In 200 A.D., Clement of Alexandria wrote, quote, "When Peter preached the word publicly at Rome and declared the gospel by the Spirit." End quote. This was quoted by Eusebius' Ecclesiastical History, Book 6, Chapter 14. Origen, another prominent writer of the early church, who lived from 185 to 253, wrote in his third book on Genesis, quote, Peter, at last, having come to Rome, he was crucified head downwards, end quote, quoted by Eusebius' Ecclesiastical History, Book 3, Chapter 1. St. Epiphanius, Bishop of Salimus, wrote in his work Panarion 27.6 in 374 A.D., quote, at Rome, the first apostles and bishops were Peter and Paul, then Linus, then Cletus, then Clement, the contemporary of Peter and Paul. End quote. In his letter to Antoninus, written in 251 A.D., Saint Cyprian, the famous bishop of Carthage, wrote concerning the bishop of Rome, Fabian, quote, "The place of Fabian, which is the place of Peter." End quote. St. Optatus, who was the chief opponent of the Donatist heresy in the 4th century, 
and the bishop of Melivus, wrote in the schism of the Donatists 2-2 in 367 A.D., quote, you cannot deny that you are aware that in the city of Rome the episcopal chair was given first to Peter, the chair in which Peter sat, the same who was head of all the apostles, the one chair in which unity is maintained by all. And any one who would set up another chair in opposition to that single chair would, by that very fact, be a schismatic and a sinner. End quote. Notice that this father indicates that the chair of Peter the chair of the bishop of Rome, is the chair of authority in which the unity of the universal church is maintained. Lactanctius, early church writer, wrote in the Deaths of the Persecutors, 2.5 in 3.20 A.D., quote, When Nero was already reigning, Peter came to Rome, where, in virtue of the performance of certain miracles which he worked, he converted many to righteousness and established a firm and steadfast temple to God, end quote. St. Augustine, a luminary of the early church, who is quoted frequently even by non-Catholics, wrote in his letter to Generosus 400 A.D. concerning the succession of bishops of the Church of Rome, quote, If the very order of episcopal succession is to be considered, how much more surely, truly, and safely do we number them from Peter himself, to whom, as to one representing the whole church, the Lord said, Upon this rock I will build my church. Peter was succeeded by Linus. End quote. Many other citations could be given to establish the undeniable historical fact that St. Peter died in Rome as a martyr and its first bishop, but we must come to the conclusion of this audio program. We will have a second part to this audio program. That audio will focus on the evidence from the earliest centuries of the Church that the Bishop of Rome was recognized as the successor to St. Peter's authority. Also, more information about how the early Church recognized the supreme jurisdiction of the Bishop of Rome as the successor to St. Peter is found on our website, www.mostholyfamilymonastery.com. There you will find more from the first seven ecumenical councils of the Christian Church, which demonstrates Catholic teaching on the papacy. This is very important because even the so-called Eastern Orthodox claim to accept these councils. The additional programs on our website also provide answers to other objections which people raise about this topic regarding the early church. In this tape we've seen the undeniable evidence that the Bible itself teaches that Jesus made St. Peter the first pope. We've seen that when God changes a person's name in the Bible, it signifies a new status and a special position, as in the case of Abraham. We've seen that God changed Simon's name to Peter, because Peter means rock, and he would be the rock upon which the church would be built. We've seen how the keys of the kingdom, which Jesus clearly promised to St. Peter in Matthew 16, signify the office of prime minister slash governor of Jesus' kingdom, just like the prime minister in the Old Testament had the key to the house of David, as shown in Isaiah chapter 22. We've seen clearly that, contrary to the claims of certain non-Catholics, the Bible teaches that St. Peter himself was the rock mentioned in Matthew 16. We've refuted the objections which certain non-Catholics raise on this point by looking at the original languages. We even quoted Protestant scholars themselves who admit that Peter is undoubtedly the rock of Matthew 16. We've seen an abundance of evidence from the early church fathers on all of these points. We've seen that Luke chapter 22 demonstrates that St. Peter was the first pope. This chapter also teaches that Jesus gave St. Peter an unfailing faith, which proves that the Catholic dogma of papal infallibility comes right from the Bible. This Catholic dogma does not mean that a true pope can never err, but that a true pope cannot err when declaring a doctrine of faith or morals in a binding fashion to the entire church. This is also shown from the words of Matthew 16. When a true pope does speak infallibly on faith or morals, he is not proclaiming a new teaching or a new gospel, but infallibly setting forth as dogma a truth which Jesus Christ revealed to the apostles. We covered John 21:15 to 17 a passage which is often overlooked. This is where Jesus entrusts his entire flock to St. Peter. We showed how the Greek of that text proves that St. Peter was given authority not just to feed the entire flock, 
but to rule the flock, that is, a primacy of jurisdiction. We also covered how it's absurd to think that Jesus made St. Peter the prime minister of his kingdom, which he clearly did, if he didn't intend for that office to continue with successors down through history, just like the office of prime minister in the Old Testament had successors. We've seen the undeniable prominence of St. Peter's name in the Bible. We've seen how this prominence in the Gospels and in the Acts of the Apostles shows that St. Peter was the first pope. This was also demonstrated by St. Peter's role in the replacement of Judas, in the disputes with the Jews, in receiving the first Gentile convert, in the vision which signified the end of the old law, at the Council of Jerusalem, and in other things. We've seen how it's an undeniable fact that St. Peter died in Rome as its first bishop. This historical fact is clearly proven by the testimony of the early church fathers, the writers of the ancient church. It has also been confirmed by archaeological discoveries. It's necessary to belong to the one church which Christ founded upon Peter, the Catholic Church, for salvation. Extra copies of this audio tape are $2, or get 15 copies for $10, or 25 copies for $15, or 50 copies for $27, or 75 copies for $35. All prices include shipping. This audio program will also be included on our MP3 audio disc, which you can get from us for only $2. Go to our website at www.MostHolyFamilyMonastery.com for more information on any of these topics. That's MostHolyFamilyMonastery.com. The last word monastery is spelled M-O-N-A-S-T-E-R-Y dot com. Or you can call us at 1-800-275-1126 or 585-567-4433. You can also write us at Most Holy Family Monastery, 4425 Schneider Road, that's spelled S-C-H-N-E-I-D-E-R Road, in Fillmore, New York, that's F-I-L-L-M-O-R-E, New York, 14735. Thank you for listening.